school. Probably all of you, certainly to all of you who have taken the bar admission course in even recent years because, of course, he heads the section and has for some years on debtors and creditors' rights. He uh, received his BA at the University of Manitoba, he graduated from Osgoode Hall Law School, and uh, is one of those people with whom we look upon with a bit of suspicion because he got his LLM later on, in his case at Yale University. 1963, Gordon was called to the Bar of Ontario with honors. He has been a partner in Smith Lyons for many years. His practice is in the commercial area and, of course, with a large emphasis on bankruptcy and on insolvency. He um, has published a number of matters dealing with the uh, proposed uh, bankruptcy legislation, which, from at least all I know about it, is always apparently proposed, and um, has spoken and lectured on the subject to many, many different groups and is, of course, one of the leading experts in this uh, field. So it's a great pleasure that uh, I uh, give you Gordon Morantz, who is our concluding speaker of this entire program. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for lasting it out to this part of the morning. Uh, I am honored to be able to participate in a March special lecture program, which is, I guess, the flagship program of the Law Society. Being given the opportunity to speak last frees me from the constraints of time, because I understand I can just keep going and going, and the challenge is to see how long I can hold you. Can you all hear me? Good. Uh, just picking up on Alan Kempchey's comment about the receivership where he was appointed and went in on Monday morning and the place was stripped bare, Alan and I are on, were on the other sides of another receivership where the debtor pledged the same inventory to two secured creditors. That matters currently in litigation to find out which secured creditor gets the inventory. The debtor, however, um, was visited by the RCMP and promptly thereafter defenestrated himself. And for those of you who don't know what that means, he stepped out of his window. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a suburban one-story building. <laughs> Alan's comments that preceded me uh, in terms of insolvency were very apt because insolvency is on the rise Defensive positions of businessmen are on the rise, and the demands on the insolvency practitioner are increasing. But by the same token, the demands on the ordinary practitioner are also increasing, because those of you who practice in the corporate and commercial field are going to be faced with the need to know more about the pitfalls and problems that your clients can fall into. Now, when asked to speak on initially changes in the bankruptcy laws or directions old and new, I felt that perhaps I would start off with a discussion of the areas of personal liability that can affect directors and officers and shareholders of bankrupt corporations, but that I would discuss that from a slightly different aspect than has been handled in the past. I am not going to look to the questions of obligations of shareholders and so forth, directors, to act fairly and to protect the interests of shareholders, but I'm going to talk about statutory obligations in favor of the Crown, revenue obligations that can come home and haunt the directors, because by and large, the statutory obligations imposed outside of the Corporations Act become a major cause of concern, and the concern usually arises when it's too late to do anything about it. This is a topic I know that terrifies most of my partners who practice in the general corporate area. I mean, they know all about central depository systems and closed systems under the Securities Act, but they don't know what they're going to get called upon to pay if they happen to conveniently be a director of a corporation that gets into financial difficulty. I'm going to go on and talk about obligations to employees. I will discuss some of the changes proposed under the new bankruptcy legislation, which is currently in the works, and if the bells ever stop ringing, and if the Constitution ever gets dealt with in London, may eventually become the law of this land. In any event, a lot of the changes contemplated will become law, whether it's by amendment to the existing statute or whether it's going to be new legislation. I'm going to touch on those with respect to shareholders and emplo to employees, rather, uh, discuss what may happen to controlling directors 
under the new bankruptcy regime and then go into a brief discussion of the rights of secured creditors, but only in some highlight areas. Now, in terms of the, the first area, the areas of liability, the claims of the Crown are an enormous problem for principles of insolvent businesses. Certainly, the Crown represents one of the most innovating government assistant short-term financing arrangements that can be made available to the businessman in trouble. And how you ask, it's very easy. What happens to employee withholding deductions? What happens to sales taxes collected? Are they remitted or does the debtor use them to finance his business? Now, I think you all know that the Income Tax Act requires that when salary is paid to employees, the employer is required to withhold an amount in respect of income taxes on the employee's payment, as well as unemployment insurance and Canada Pension Plan. He's supposed to set that aside in a separate trust. And then on the 15th day of the month following, he's obliged to remit that to the Crown. Well, nobody, unless I'm very much surprised, nobody ever sets the employee withholding deductions apart. Come payday, you cut a check for the amount that's owing to your employees, and then if you're in trouble, you sort of hold your breath to the 15th of the month following, and if you've got enough cash around, you'll write a check to the government. But the funds are never segregated and set apart. That's contrary to the express provision of the statute. Now, I refer to the statutes many times. The paper that eventually you will get has all of the references, all of the cases, so you needn't worry about them for the moment. But in any event, the amounts that are to be withheld in trust, if it's not done, that constitutes an offense under the Income Tax Act. It's punishable on conviction, and therefore it's a quasi-criminal offense. Where a corporation is guilty of an offense under the Act, an officer, director, or agent of the corporation who directed, authorized, assented to, acquiesced in, or participated in the commission of the offense is a party to and guilty of the offense and is liable on conviction to the punishment provided for the offense, whether or not the corporation has been prosecuted or convicted. So therefore, if the corporation is in default in filing and paying tax, those officers and directors who took part in the activity are going to be equal, equally liable and subject to prosecution. And there are courts over in the provincial court that virtually deal with nothing but prosecutions of businessmen who fail to make remittances. There is a maximum penalty provided by the statute in respect of each offense, but the Department of National Revenue takes the position that each separate pay period constitutes a separate event for the purpose of an offense. And what will happen is if there's been failure to remit, to withhold and remit over a period of three or four months, you may have as many as 15 or 16 pay periods that are open and the Crown will lay a charge in respect of each period. I have appeared with numerous debtors, principals of debtor corporations, who have been charged for week one, week two, week three, and so forth. There's a fine payable in each case. I remember well an individual whose company gone into serious financial difficulty. We were attempting to negotiate a settlement of his personal obligations under the statutes. We went up to see income tax collections, who are a stern-faced bunch with absolutely no sense of humor to deal with. But we were able to negotiate a settlement at some considerable cost to my client. But the director of uh, collections said, look, we've got three charges pending. We'll agree not to go ahead with the other 12 or 15. We will not ask for anything more than the minimum on each one of these offenses, but your client's going to have to appear. So the individual director of the corporation went up provincial court. He was <clears throat> pleaded guilty. The provincial court judge assessed the fine and he said $200 on each count, which wasn't too bad, and he said 30 days in jail. <laughs> and the businessman client's face went white and you could start to see his knees buckle and as he was about to hit the deck, the provincial court judge said, in default of payment. <laughs> But the lesson was learned. There is nothing more terrifying. In terms of the question of intent and what the Crown must do in order to get a conviction, remember, if they don't have to go after the corporation first. If the corporation is guilty of an offense, then the director or officer who participated is equally guilty. And you can prosecute that director. 
But if you do, the Crown must prove first that the corporation is in fact guilty of the offence, although the corporation is not an accused, and then that the accused individual is an officer and that he participated. As for the degree of intent, a recent British Columbia case, O'Dare, held that mens rea in the traditional sense is not an essential ingredient of the offence. It may well be that certain offences under the Income Tax Act would, by their very nature, require proof of full mens rea. Other offences may be offences involving strict liability when no mens rea need be proved. In this particular case, the chief financial officer of the corporation had issued checks to Revenue Canada. He, the checks were not honoured by the bank, and the court found that the accused had acquiesced in the practice of not setting monies aside and that his professed belief that checks would clear the bank was not reasonable, nor did he take reasonable steps to see that the checks would be honoured. The court held a lack of reasonable care was sufficient to support a conviction. So there is considerable parallel there for financial officers of corporations. Now, as I say, UIC and Canada Pension Plan have similar problems that will arise with them. Consider also federal sales tax. Again, those who are subject to federal sales and excise taxes sell goods, they bill their customers for federal sales tax, the money comes in, the month following you're supposed to file a return and remit. But if you're in trouble, are you going to pay the government? The government doesn't provide, provide essential goods and services, you don't get inventory from them, they're not like a workforce that you have to pay or they won't come back. The government can wait because after all, come two or three months from now, business will turn around and then you can pay your arrears of federal sales tax. It's surprising how easily these numbers add up. There can be a very substantial liability and government has been in the past rather slow in clamping down on businesses that fall, arrears, that fall in arrears in their sales tax remittances. So that's a financing opportunity, but it can present some problems. Now, under the Excise Tax Act, Failure to pay uh, constitutes an offence. There's a penalty provided plus an amount equal to the tax not paid. So if you fail to pay federal excise taxes, the corporation will be charged, may be convicted, $1,000 fine plus the amount of the unpaid taxes, which could be twenty or thirty or $100,000. That doesn't discharge the tax liability because that still remains. So it winds up somebody's going to pay twice. The statute goes on to say that every director or officer or agent who condoned, etc., etc., is also liable. But he's only liable if the corporation is first convicted. So they've got to secure a conviction against the corporation under excise tax, and then they may move against the directors and officers. Now, in terms of the question of mens rea, again, the director can have the necessary intent, or he will be found to have had the intent, if he fails to act, quote, through the complicity of silence. So if you sit back, you let the company carry on, Revenue Canada will take the position that you allowed this to happen, and by allowing it to happen, you're responsible. They take the view, the courts have held that the purpose of this section is to compel every director to see personally and to ascertain, if necessary, whether or not all taxes due to date under the Act have been paid by the company. So that puts a very broad-ranging responsibility on directors of corporations. I have acted uh, in the past for directors, including partners in major Toronto law firms who have been directors of convenience for some of their clients, who have been threatened with charges under the Excise Tax Act. And we've had to go up and negotiate settlements with excise tax of Revenue Canada. And in dealing with the collection officer there, he was an awfully nice guy, but he said to me, you know, Mr. Morantz, when I hear the word businessman, I spell it C-R-O-O-K. And I said, is that the official policy of Revenue Canada? Now, he backed off. But the department, through this officer, took the position that if a director or an officer is empowered to sign checks, or co-sign checks on behalf of the corporation, then they are at jeopardy if they do not ensure that withholding federal sales tax obligations are paid. 
that is a very strict burden and if you're a director or an officer obviously you can see something to worry about so it's not just your clients that you've got to watch out for if they're trying to protect their position on limited liability there is your own position because most of you either as directors of convenience or for other reasons are directors of your client corporations there are similar problems under OHIP OHIP prof, uh, Ontario Health Insurance Plan provides for criminal penalties in the event of failure to remit and they impose a civil penalty liability on directors and officers. The standards are the same as set forth in the federal taxing statutes. When there's a bankruptcy or if a corporation goes into liquidation and OHIP premiums are not paid, the directors are once again liable. Similarly, the Retail Sales Tax Act has language that parallels the Income Tax Act in imposing personal liability. Now, what does this all really mean? How practical is it? Will the departments come after individuals? Will they come after the collateral directors? Or are they going to go after the prime movers of the corporation? If one watches the trends that our governments are taking, revenue is an increasingly greater demand. There's a short supply of money, and they have to turn every stone to find the dollars where they can. And I expect that collection officers who are a breed apart unto themselves and who have considerable discretion in who they go after are going to look at who is technically liable, who has got the dollars in their pocket, and they're going to pursue the deep dollar theory. Therefore, I think there is an increasing risk on directors for prosecution. It has not always happened in the past. It has been only in the cases where there have been blatant abuses, where there may have been misrepresentations made to the department, but I think it's going to be a far greater reaching danger in the future. Now, one of a uh, lawyer in corporate practice in the city recently consulted with me in a situation where he and another one of his partners constitute a board of directors of three on a client corporation. The principal officer and shareholder of the client is the third director. It is a fairly substantial business. They have a very substantial bank line. The company is in financial difficulty. <clears throat> An assessment is being done, it's being reviewed, and an operating plan is being put forward to the bank. But my client, the lawyer, came in and said, what are my problems? And I outlined to him all of the areas of personal responsibility, and he became decidedly uncomfortable, particularly since employee withholding deductions were due. Well, after much scrambling, the bank agreed to allow a check to go through to pay employee withholding deductions. For that period, the lawyer relaxed a little bit, and I said to him, John, you have really no business under these circumstances in being a director of this company. You should resign. Well, he said, if I resign and if the other chap in the office resigns, that's going to show a lack of confidence to the bank, and the bank will think that we don't have the confidence in the client, and if we don't have the confidence, why should the bank continue to support the client? Well, that's his problem, because that's his dilemma as to where he owes his responsibility to his client or to himself. Uh, there's not an easy answer to that question. It's better if you don't get into the problem. That's a counsel of perfection, because I don't know how many of you are prepared to say to a client who wants the convenience of a third director uh, or a Canadian director to make up his qua qualifications under the corporation statutes, no, I don't think I should be a director because there are risks involved. Are you going to lose the client? Is he going to say, I'm going to go to another lawyer who's more accommodating? If you do accept the appointment, remember, it carries with it problems. And if you're going to be getting an indemnity from the principal shareholder, if it's a subsidiary of a foreign corporation, even if you get an indemnity from the foreign corporation, what value is the indemnity? If the Canadian company gets into difficulty, will there be any recovery from the parent? And are you going to have to go to a foreign jurisdiction to collect? So there are a number of problems with which I say there are absolutely no easy answers. Now, another area of problem that can run out for a shareholder, uh, or director rather, is how to preserve his limited liability under corporation law. We all know about Salomon and Salomon, but Mr. Salomon didn't have a bank that wanted a personal guarantee. And <clears throat> Invariably, especially if you're financing with institutions, they want the principal shareholder to guarantee his obligations. How best can the principal shareholder protect his own position? Well, it is stating the obvious, but people seem to fail to realize how important it is 
that the bank be more than adequately secured. Because if the bank is secured and if it's got full first claim on the assets, the bank gets paid first. Once the bank is paid, the principal shareholder is off his guarantee liability. And that's something that's very important. And if the bank chooses not to lend money to the business enterprise, but decides to lend the money to the principal shareholder and he puts it into the business, make sure that that loan is fully secured. There is much law dealing with guarantees, and there's a recent Supreme Court of Canada decision called Bauer and Bank of Montreal. The bank didn't register the security properly. The guarantee said that the bank may abstain from taking securities from or from perfecting securities of the customer. Mr. Bauer said, bank, you didn't, reg you didn't register my securities on the company. You've released me from my guarantee obligation. The Supreme Court of Canada said, Mr. Bauer, you're right in common law, but in contract, you contracted away that common law right. Therefore, the bank had no obligation to perfect its securities. You're still liable. So if you're a guarantor, you're acting for a guarantor, make damn sure that the bank has registered the security properly. Otherwise, your client may be facing liability. Now, I'm not really going to hold you to 1 o'clock. There are other <clears throat> problems. Again, an old chestnut, but it keeps coming back. A case called Holtz and G&G Parkdale Refrigeration involving ex-signing of checks. Check bore the printed name of the corporate drawer on its face. On the line below the corporate name, the defendant, who was the president of the corporation, signed the check. There was no indication on the face of the check that he was signing in his capacity as a corporate officer. <coughs> and not on his own account. It was just XYZ Limited, John Smith. Although this may have appeared to be a corporate check, Mr. Justice Hollingworth held the absence of words indicating a representative capacity to be fatal to the defense and found the president personally liable. That case did not go to appeal. It is a terrifying decision. The chartered banks, when they print checks, or when anybody prints checks for corporations, will put XYZ limited and they'll have a line. If they put the word buy, as you all know from law school days, that solves the problem. And possibly on the Parkdale case, if when you sign, you put president or secretary under your signature, <coughs> you've indicated the representative capacity. But certainly when you have checks printed, if you can have the word buy printed on the check, you solve a problem and eliminate another area of potential liability. Now, another area of problem that <coughs> is of particular interest to insolvency lawyers deals with this whole question of crown priority for statutory liens. Because apart from the fact that you're personally liable if the company doesn't pay, the crown has, in most cases, a certain degree of statutory priority or lien for tax revenues. Excuse me. Just If the Crown has priority over an un a secured creditor, over the bank, and gets its money first, you're faced with a position where the bank may have a shortfall. So although the Crown is satisfied <coughs> and potential personal liability is reduced, you've got to deal with the bank and pay on your guarantee. If you put the company into bankruptcy, there is a string of jurisprudence from the Supreme Court of Canada and now in some of the other provinces that have been knocking out crown priority in the event of a bankruptcy. So there's this brilliant idea, well, let's put the company into bankruptcy while you're in receivership. You knock the crown priority to the end of the road, and the bank gets paid out in full. And as a creditor, you're protected on your guarantee. Except then, the other side of the coin is you've got six government departments, each of whom may wish to go against you because they didn't get paid. And the question of personal liability. So the whole question of whether you place a company in bankruptcy, because that's apart from receivership. Secured creditor realization is one thing, a bankruptcy is another step. But if you move from a secured creditor realization, put the company into bankruptcy, push the prior claims of the Crown to the back of the line or to the middle of the line, you're just trading one creditor, the bank as a guarantor, for another creditor, the Crown. We had a situation not long ago where my client was the principal shareholder and guarantor of his corporation. The corporation went into receivership because it wasn't successful. My client had ample assets to meet 
all demands made on him out of this. He was called on his guarantee, and he, in fact, was going to have to pay under the guarantee. We were also faced with this problem of outstanding sales taxes to a number of provincial jurisdictions. The thought was, for $25,000, we can put this company into bankruptcy. We will save $160,000 in tax liabilities. And as we were just getting all our counsel together, uh, covering the various provincial jurisdictions as to what we should do, the various tax departments all made demands on the director of the corporation personally. At that point, there didn't seem to be much point in going the bankruptcy route. We were just trading, as I say, one creditor for another. Tactically, you may find it's better to have the Crown paid and then attempt to negotiate a settlement of liabilities with one secured creditor, such as a bank. They may be easier to deal with than the various governmental departments, but nobody can tell you for sure because each circumstance has to be dealt with on its own facts. Dividends. Another area of concern, there's provision under the Ontario Business Corporations Act for directors being liable for the declaration and payment of dividends at a time when the corporation is insolvent. There's an obligation to show that the corporation was insolvent when the payment of dividend was made. In 1967, the Bankruptcy Act was amended to provide that dividends paid, shares redeemed, within a one-year period of bankruptcy were attackable by a trustee in bankruptcy, and once the trustee attacked those payments within the one-year period, the obligation was on the person who received the dividend to show that the company wasn't insolvent at the time. So there was a shift in the burden of proof in one case, under the Ontario statute, the burden of proof was on the person attacking the payment. Under the federal statute, under the Bankruptcy Act, there was an onus, there was a deemed presumption in effect of insolvency. The person receiving the payment had to show that the company wasn't insolvent. I've only been able to find two reported cases dealing with this particular topic uh, under the Bankruptcy Act. Both of them are relatively recent, but both of them, one of them in particular, is very interesting because it deals with the payment of dividends as a means of remunerating the officer of the company. The case was called Telsten Services. The principal of the company was its full-time chief executive officer. We're not talking about large companies. We're talking about a closely held corporation. He ran the company. He got, uh, in the year preceding bankruptcy, 42 payments of approximately $750 each, some $30,000. These payments were treated in the books of account of the bankrupt and in the financial statements for the relevant year as a dividend. In addition, he received salary of some $2,500. The corporation was insolvent at the time the payments were made. There was no formal declaration of dividend and there was no reference to a payment of dividend in the minute book of the corporation. Both the corporation and Mr. S had treated the $30,000 as constituting a dividend. Now, I'm sure many of your clients do this. The principal will draw a certain amount throughout the year. It will be carried as an advance to a shareholder. At the end of the year, after the auditors come in and after everybody figures out what the appropriate mix is, a dividend will be declared to a certain level, there'll be a certain amount of salary paid, and the book accounts will be reversed. So this is not an unusual situation. The company went bankrupt. The matter was treated as a dividend for all external purposes, and the trustee in bankruptcy moved to recover the dividend. Mr. Justice Anderson in the bankruptcy court found that notwithstanding the manner in which the payments were treated by the company and by the shareholder, there had been no declaration of dividend by the directors in the manner contemplated by the Business Corporations Act. There was no evidence before his lordship of the directors having anything, done anything in connection with the impugned payments. And I'll just quote from a portion of the reasons. The manner in which the payments were reflected and dealt with in the books of account of the corporation do not comprise acts of the directors or of the corporation appropriate to the declaration or payment of a dividend. I would therefore conclude that as a matter of corporate law and having regard for the Business Corporations Act, which governs the existence and affairs of the bankrupt, there has been no dividend declared or paid. Now, that particular case has been criticized in a comment, the effect that it's a pretty narrow, slender thread to hang the thing on to say there wasn't a formal de declaration of dividend 
when everybody else who was involved with the corporation had treated it as such. You would wonder that there wasn't some degree of estoppel preventing the shareholder from denying that he had received the dividend. But on the other hand, in terms of equity, if the individual had worked long and hard in the business and took $32,000 as his remuneration for the year, that wasn't out of line either, and it seems rather harsh to penalize someone for a technical defect. In any event, with the court having held that the dividend wasn't a dividend, it raises the question, will the tax department reassess this individual and treat the payment to him as income rather than as a dividend? I will not go into detail, but I'll just refer to the problems rela relating to breach of trust. The Mechanics Lien Act, for example, says monies received by a contractor, etc., are held in trust. If those monies are applied to some other purpose, it's a breach of trust, and the person who makes the payment will be held liable to account for them. As a simple example, Mr. A owes money in respect of two pieces of property. He gets a mortgage advance on property one. He has people working on property one under the Mechanics Lien Act. He holds that money in trust for the contractors. But as he gets his mortgage draw, he uses it to pay off monies owing on another project to another creditor. Those creditors who are not satisfied on project one will have an action against the individual for breach of trust and may recover the monies from him that he paid in another direction. So that you will go right through corporate entities, corporations own the lands, but the director who counseled the payment of money here or there and he paid it over here because he released his personal guarantee will be called to account if there's an action for breach of trust. There have been few of them but as people become more aware of their rights in that respect, I think you can expect to see an increase in that kind of litigation. Employee wage claims. Um, there is provision under the Ontario statute for liability of directors for unpaid employees' wages for a period of six months prior to bankruptcy or insolvency or business failure. That is a very strict test, and it is very difficult, if not impossible, for a director to wriggle out of liability under that one. Uh, I have defended a number, not terribly successfully, because we've been yet to find a really good defense for someone who has been a director when there's been a bankruptcy. The new Bankruptcy Act has, or the bill, Bill C-12, deals with the question of rights of wage earners, and there's an interesting proposition currently under consideration. There has been a report uh, of a committee headed by Dean Raymond Landry of University of Ottawa Law School which has recommended some form of wage earner insurance or protection scheme. The initial plans under the bankruptcy legislation had called for a super priority in favor of wage earners to give them first place in line ahead of even secured creditors up to a certain maximum. That caused a great hue and cry from the secured creditor segment of the community, not unjustifiably because it becomes a very arbitrary readjustment of creditors' rights. The proposal put forward by Landry after about a six-month investigation period was that nobody knew enough about unpaid wage earners in insolvency and business failure situations, and therefore one could not come up with a definitive proposal. But they thought that some form of insurance scheme on some contributory basis would not be a bad idea, but they needed more information. As a result, they have suggested that there be a three-year introduction period during which the Consolidated Revenue Fund would be used to pay claims of employees up to a defined limit of $1,000 who were not paid on the failure of a business. That would be administered by trustees in bankruptcy and receivers in non-bankruptcy situations. They'd be reimbursed out of the CRF, which is out of taxpayer dollars. During that period, they would hope to get sufficient data to enable them to put forward some kind of a plan for a contributory insurance scheme. Now, nobody knows where that one stands because it's got lost somewhere in the department. Uh, when John Howard was deputy minister, he was very instrumental in moving ideas forward. It seems that things have sort of ground to a halt in Ottawa, at least in terms of this area of law reform. The question, though, of director's liability, the bank of the new legislation also provides for liability of directors for unpaid wages of employees. Again, a great hue and cry raised, but those who cried out neglected 
to consider that every provincial corporation statute and the Canada Business Corporations Act all have provision for liability of directors. In fact, the provisions in the new bankruptcy legislation are less stringent from the point of view of the director than those under provincial law. Because under the proposed new legislation, if a director can show that he relied on professional advice, financial statements, representative representations by officers or managers of the corporation, then he may exonerate himself from liability. Agents. The new bill designates a creature called an agent. An agent is, in effect, someone who is the governing light of a corporate or a partnership business enterprise. Where the agent has, will, will have breached the level of conduct that is prescribed for him, he may be held responsible for a deficit in the corporation's affairs. What this means is you sweep away the corporate veil. And if you, as the controlling light of a corporation, have done something prohibited by the statute, improper, you will be liable for the deficit and have to make up the shortfall to the creditors. Um, what sort of conduct will bring this horrible remedy down on your heads? Well, without going into the convoluted and lengthy wording of the statute, my paraphrase says that for an agent to be held responsible, he must be found to have acted in his own pecuniary interest or in the interest of someone related to him and have caused the corporation, when insolvent, to have carried on or refrained from carrying on business or have entered into transactions that were contrary to the pecuniary interest of the corporation. I don't know what it means any more than you do. Other conduct giving rise to the operation of this section will include sales below cost to the detriment of creditors and ruinous borrowings or similar acts when it was not reasonable to expect that bankruptcy could be prevented and where those acts would aggravate the insolvency of the corporation. So you've got an area that is going to be open to a large degree of judicial interpretation and discretion. Sales below cost are a normal merchandising event. The original drafts of this bill provided the penalty for sales below cost. There go all your clearance sales. But you have to show that sales below cost were one to the detriment of creditors, and it wasn't reasonable to expect that you could prevent bankruptcy by doing so. While the tests are going to be very difficult to establish and meet, and the standards will take a lot of interpretation, the problem is, of course, that the businessman whose conduct may have been marginal is going to be faced with the risk of a, a challenge and an attack under this legislation, and he's going to have to defend himself. Now, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is with respect to just the problem that will befall agents, being directors and officers, when they haven't done anything nearly as bad as outlined in the liability section, but where they may have had business conduct that was not entirely 100%. There's a less severe standard which can bring down on their heads the terrible problem of a caveat. Now, the present Bankruptcy Act lists areas of conduct that will disentitle an individual bankrupt, a person, from getting an absolute discharge. And that includes everything from frivolous and vexatious defenses to lawsuits to wild and reckless extravagance, uh, imprudent conduct of his business affairs, a whole host of offenses, many of which can be hung on individuals who carry on business. Obviously, if you do it in a corporate sense, you're protected. What the new bill proposes to do is take these standards of sloppy business practice and say, OK, if you were the guiding light of the corporation, and if you did all of these sloppy things that we couldn't get you for before, the administrator, who is the senior administrative officer in the department, the bankruptcy administration, can file a caveat against you. And once you've got a caveat filed against you, you're almost like a bankrupt. You can't take credit. You can't run a business. You cannot manage a business. So what will happen is that those persons who carried on suspect or improper business practices, who under present law could not be held in any way accountable for them, may, at the instance of a government officer, be accorded the status of a bankrupt 
which will have the effect of keeping them out of business for up to five years. So that means if you run the waterbed store and you bilk your creditors, it goes into bankruptcy, you have your wife's company buy back the inventory, and you go and run the business for your wife, you won't be able to do it anymore. That's an example. It's covered in greater detail, maybe more coherently in the text, but those are just some of the things you can watch out for. Your clients who have shed one corporate entity and plan to move on to another may be precluded from doing so. Now, if the administrator, the government officer says, no, I'm not going to bring that down on somebody's head, it's open for the trustee of a bankrupt estate or the creditors to have it done. But if the trustee moves, he must prove the case. If the administrator files the caveat, the burden is on the individual to convince the court it should be removed. He wasn't responsible for what happened. If the trustee or the creditors want to move, they have the burden of establishing that the individual performed improperly. So the burden of proof is a little different in those situations. We're down to secured creditors, and we've got a few minutes left. The secured creditors are important. One, Alan talked about secured creditor realizations in terms of receiverships, and that really is where the action is these days. They talk about bankruptcy, but because secured creditors have such a preeminent position in the credit field, most realizations are conducted by them, and there is very often nothing left over for unsecured creditors. If there's nothing left over for unsecured creditors, you know, they're very often given the, uh, the mushroom treatment. They're covered up and kept in the dark. <laughs> Secured creditors justifiably in many cases feel they are being done. There is no way under the present legislation for really effectively stopping a secured creditor once he gets going on a realization. There's no automatic stay. The trustee has no control if a proposal is planned to control secured creditors. You can have acceleration of security agreements by reason of a bankruptcy clause, even though there may have been no material default under the contract or the terms of the contract. Trustees sometimes have difficulty in assessing the position of secured creditors. The stay provisions under the present Bankruptcy Act are really minimal because they do not affect a secured creditor unless an application is made to the court and then the stay is for a limited period. And in any event, if you have a proposal, which is the statutory form of reorganization, the stay is even more difficult to get because you cannot get to the court to ask for a stay until after the proposal has been approved by the creditors and the court. By the time you get that far down the road, the secured creditor may have liquidated the underlying assets. This represents, the terms of the stay, a definite shift in the balance of power from the secured creditor to the trustee. But I'm going to suggest to you that as ominous as this shift sounds, it may not have any really material economic consequence to secured creditors. <clears throat> Once a bankruptcy order will have been made under the new act, that is the, not the petition, but the actual order adjudicating bankruptcy, there is an automatic stay for a period of 10 days after the creditor has secured creditors filed a proof of his security interest with the trustee or until after the date of the first meeting of creditors. So a secured creditor, if he hasn't realized before the bankruptcy, is going to be held up in his realization at least until 10 days after the first meeting of creditors. That could be a 30-day or more stay automatically. Now, it's not going to apply in every case because if you've got perishables, the secured creditor will be able to go ahead. If the secured creditor is in possession of the debtor's assets and he is carrying on business, collecting accounts receivable, selling inventory, converting work in progress, then he may continue to do so. He will be precluded from selling off the plant, but he can take the raw materials, work them through, and carry on the business. If the secured creditor, before the date of the bankruptcy, had entered into an agreement for the sale of the assets under his security, he will be entitled to proceed, provided he tells the trustee and gives him details of the sale. In other words, if you've, con if you've contracted to sell, you'll be able to keep on going. And if there's been a tender or an auction sale advertised and a bankruptcy intervenes, 
that will not be aborted. They will be able to continue. So that there will be some stay, but it should not be material in that very little happens within 30 days. It will cause some inconvenience to secured creditors, but bear in mind also that we now have under the Personal Property Security Act a 15-day notice requirement, and in many cases in terms of mortgages of real estate, you have a 35-day notice period in exercising a power of sale. This will become something that secured creditors will learn to live with. Realizations, as much as we all like to think we're efficient when we act for secured creditors, don't really happen that fast. Now with commercial arrangements, those are proposals. Under the new act, they're going to be called commercial arrangements. <clears throat> under our present legislation, you cannot bind a secured creditor under a proposal. So if the debtor wants to make a proposal and include the secured creditor as part of it or wants the secured creditor's support, he's got to make a private deal with them. He can't stop the secured creditor. Under the new legislation, there will be the ability, first of all, to file a notice of intention to make an arrangement. It's a notice saying, we're going to file a proposal. The debtor is obliged to file his definitive proposal within 10 days or within such other period as the court allows. Once the debtor files a notice of intention, all secured creditors are stayed. They're stayed, they will be stayed because nobody at that point knows whether the arrangement is going to affect them or not. Once the actual arrangement is filed, the, uh, the bill provides that if the secured creditor is not proposed to be affected, if he's not included under that arrangement, then there's no stay operative, he can go off and do whatever he wants. If he is affected by the arrangement, then he will be stayed. Now, you're going to get into an interesting area in practice because <coughs> what sort of uh, proposals will be planned to affect a secured creditor. If it's a bank, it may be a question that the bank will just allow its loan to continue in place. The bank will want its interest, it will be entitled to it as a secured creditor, and the bank will want the full value of its security and it will stand in first place. If you're going to do anything to the bank, I think the bank's going to have to agree. There's going to, there is provision in the bill for creditors voting in classes, particularly secured creditors. And it may well be that if secured creditors are of different rank, and if they are being treated in a manner other than their security provides for, each rank may constitute a separate class. And if each rank constitutes a separate class, then you've got to have the consent of the class, the creditor. You may not be able to do your proposals without getting the secured creditor on board anyhow. The stay is something obviously none of us have any experience with. It's something to look forward to. Uh, Bankruptcy alone will not allow a secured creditor to accelerate payments. Restrictions on transfer. Uh, conditional vendors or lessors very often have provisions in their security agreements to the effect that the uh, debtor cannot transfer the pro equity in the property. Unless there's good reason that the secured creditor can show, a debtor will be free to transfer equity in property. So there's going to be a lot more freedom to the trustee in bankruptcy to deal with residual interests of debtors. Secured creditors aren't going to really be prejudiced having the game very much to themselves in the past. They're going to have to play a little bit more by somebody else's set of rules, but the system has safeguards built into it. I think in the vast majority of cases, the rules aren't going to make much difference because people act on what makes the best economic sense. And in insolvency situations, you don't really have time to take hard and fast positions. You do have to come up with an economic result. And in most cases, the legislation shouldn't make too much difference. Now, Alan talked about the obligations of receivers. And he mentioned the provisions of the Canada Business Corporations Act to act uh, in a commercially, in a reasonable manner and fairly and so forth. That is carried forward into the new Bankruptcy Act. And I have read through a number of cases dealing with the obligations of receivers. They're referred to in the materials, but I've come to the conclusion that everything contained in the Act does nothing more than restate what is pretty much the position under common law at the present time. So I don't see that the legislation imposes any additional burdens or duties on secured creditors acting to realize their security. The ground rules, I think, are pretty much the same. There is, of course, additional access to the courts, to those persons who are aggrieved by what a secured creditor is doing. This may become 
a means of abuse and of holding up secured creditors where unsecureds or junior secureds may attempt to hold up the senior secured to get a better position for themselves to try a little economic blackmail. Receiverships. <clears throat> Receiverships of insolvent debtors are presently carried out under the provisions of Section 19 of the Judicature Act if you go for a court appointment. <clears throat> in British Columbia, the BC Corporations Act has a provision for summary appointment of receivers when you've started off by way of a private appointment, by instrument. The Bankruptcy Act has provisions that bring within it all receivership of insolvent debtors. So whether it's a privately appointed receiver under instrument or whether it's a receivership that may have started under Section 19 of the Judicature Act, if it's an insolvent debtor, you will be bound by the provisions of the Act. These provisions <coughs> have give the courts authority, for example, to remove a receiver. A privately appointed receiver can be move, removed by the court at the instance of a trustee in bankruptcy or the unsecured creditors. However, if a receiver can demonstrate to the court that there's, in essence, no equity in the secured property for interests junior to the primary secured creditor, then the court will not intervene. This whole question, which is again discussed in the paper, gives rise to the interesting issue of how does a secured creditor or a receiver go into court while he's in the process of trying to realize and explain to the court that there's no equity in the property for unsecured creditors, he's going to have to establish what the value of that property is. And once he starts trying to establish what the value is, he's advertising to the buying world what he expects to get for the property. And he may, in fact, be materially injuring his ability to get a more effective sale. And if he can't get a high value sale, it's the junior creditors that may suffer. That area is going to have some rough edges that will have to be worked out and procedures developed to protect the confidentiality, for example, of a secured creditor's opinion. There is, however, one very beneficial factor in this legislation. It enables the court to give directions to a receiver in a wide variety of circumstances and, in effect, allows secured creditors to start realizations by private appointment and when they get into trouble, to go to the courts for directions for, without having to have a full-blown court receivership. For example, questions of priority of competing interests, com priority of other claims, questions of defects on title, obtaining vesting orders, and so forth, can all be brought before the, will be able to be brought before the court in a summary manner to make life just a little easier, both for the receiver who's conveying and the person who's purchasing. Because very often, those of you who've acted for clients who are purchasing from a receiver, you have an area of concern as to whether the receiver can sell you what he's purporting to sell to you and whether you're getting what you think you're getting. There will be an ability to go to the court on an inexpensive basis to get the vesting order or the approval of the court. That brings me to the end of the prepared text. I think in summary, two things. One, be ever aware, wary when you're dealing with your own clients in terms of outstanding liabilities that may come to rest upon their heads personally or upon yours if you're a director. And in terms of where the changes are going, I think you'll see more opportunity for intervention by the courts, particularly in regulating the affairs of secured creditors vis-a-vis -vis the general body of creditors. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon, very much. A very fitting end to the series. Two things. Would you please fill in your valuation forms? If you feel like so doing, leave them in the box. Secondly, of course, you will be getting the bound edition of these lectures in due course. And thirdly, may I ask that you, on behalf of all of the lectures in this excellent series, uh, give them a bit of a hand. Thank you.